Oh, I guess I hit the button. All right, let me turn off extraneous noise. So what I've done here, hello. Hello again, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Easter Sunday, 2020. Um, I have, I question how the quality comes out for everybody on YouTube. Probably won't buffer the same as each other, so I don't know that you'll be able to have two angles. Um, Spain, Nicholas, David, David, two Davids. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming around. A uh, little flute discussion going on over there. Um, today, what I've decided to do, um, and, and there may be a few theological or philosophical tangents, although I try to get those out of my system just by pretending I'm telling everyone before the concert. Um, is uh, just focus on the music. So normally when I put a set together, and this is something that comes from the days of being in bands, uh, rock bands and funk bands, um, you try to design a set that's roughly um, got some variety, or as um, Tom Waits has said in videos, uh, interviews, like a high school or middle school dance, like fast, fast, slow, fast, fast, slow. Um, that's not full variety of, uh, of, let's say, a progressive rock concert, but something like that. So for, for even when I started playing solo shakuhachi, that's, that's been, I would do a solo set. The Heavy Roots shakuhachi ensemble would close the show. Um, so today, because it's kind of a bonus extra um, concert, I've decided to sort of uh, cater to my own desires and do a set that is uh, halfway towards what I would consider a real um, immersion in just the sound of the big flutes. So in my mind, I've been constructing more meditation sessions based not just on the appropriate uh, Zen repertoire for the bigger flutes, but also some of my original pieces, like what I put on the album Mountain Hermit Secret Wisdom, which was the closest at the time, six years ago, that I was gonna do a sort of a meditation album. It's more of a nature uh, expansion album. Avant nature music, as I call it. I'm always coming up with new genre names. So when I came up with Bamboo Gospel, that that I was very happy about that. I find that gospel and rural blues that go back and let's say roots music in America, Black American music, even mid 1800s, which we don't have recordings, but some performers in the 20s were still playing some of those same styles, which I talked about last time. So. Um, everybody was uh, was taking my recommendations very seriously, which is both great and a little bit of responsibility. So I have a little stack of some albums and a uh, couple of books over here that I'll get to when I need a break. And um, But Blind Willie Johnson was a big influence on me, and he was recorded 10 years before Robert Johnson. Um, 1927 was his recordings. He was a Texas uh, street musician and an incredible singer and guitarist, and it's gospel blues. It's not, it's not uh, secular music, but the style is, is not um, church style. It's um, solo slide, bottleneck guitar, um, vocal music. And so they're not separate um, threads to me. So blues, if I say that word, you hear, you hear maybe a whole band in your head at this time. So the, the bamboo may not be a blues instrument. Gospels in church. Uh, Zen is a reverent uh, devotional practice. And so these strands aren't separate. And culturally, there's been a battle, right? Secular versus sacred and so forth. That's the history of every musical tradition. So I consider this my way of evolving the Zen um, shakuhachi tradition by tuning into the bamboo itself. By, by sort of a symbiotic relationship with the bamboo. So here's my uh, reverend Boots advice to everyone out there. When in doubt, check yourself to see if whatever you're engaging with another person or your instrument, are you, in, are you attempting for power over or power uh, with? 
in, in terms of a symbiotic relationship. So that's my goal. So I'm going to do seven original pieces uh, for the big flutes today. Like I said, there's a little monochromatic stylistically, but I think there's some neurological benefit and spiritual benefit if we all stay in that mode for a while. So I'm going to try to do short introductions. Uh, the first piece is Black Earth, uh, which is a, um, uh, actually one of my few 12 bar blues. And it's also the name of my Shagachi school, of which there are several representatives here joining us. And the idea is it's east-west school, mostly devoted to the, the solo Zen repertoire in Shagahachi, not some of the other um, small ensemble court music. And this new evolution that is rooted in rural blues, old gospel, and picks up the thread from where the woodwind wizards I mentioned last week uh, come in with this uh, cosmic, devotional, creative prowess. Uh, John Coltrane, Eric Dolphy, Rasa, Roland Kirk, and uh, a few others. Everybody's so everybody's ready to go. Okay, we gave we gave enough time for people to get here. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here's some music. <laughs>
Thank you. As I mentioned last last week, feel free to clap. I can probably tell when you're clapping. Let me go look at one of these uh, astral devices here. Oh, somebody said there's a call and response. Um, <coughs> aspect got a little tickle in the throat there. You got to just <clears throat> play through. We would have in Edmund Wells my bass clarinet quartet. Circular breathing is a big part of the music I write because it it. Um, asks the player to do rhythm section roles, drums, rhythm guitar, drones, patterns, particularly bass line. We talked about that last time. So you really can't stop the sound. So if you have to, if you have to burp, for instance, we also developed like a circular burp. I don't know what goes on in there, but you get it out of your system, but the sound doesn't stop. So <clears throat> the tickle, it's a little bit harder. Okay, there's a little, little um, Mississippi Hill Country. I like seeing that phrase up here. Uh-huh, that's right. Okay, Otha Turner, I will check that out. Yeah, there's some fife and drum stuff that I know deserves um, further research. And that's a really good um, comment for our, one of my first recommendations here. So as as um, Vincent over there pointed out, Mississippi Hill, Mississippi Hill Country Blues has a whole different tradition than the Delta Blues that, that migrated quite a bit to Chicago. And one of the let's call them lineage holders, is um, Cedric Burnside, Arl Burnside's grandson. And I didn't realize that he was very um, out there performing these days. So check out Cedric Burnside. And this album came out in 2018. I just got it yesterday in the mail. It's called Benton County Relic. It's pretty awesome. We listened to it twice in a row last night. And um, you know what I talked about <coughs> last time, the 12 bar blues has a particular chord changes and that was part of uh, early jazz. Uh, a lot of Mississippi Hill country blues is more drone kind of just modal. And that's how I've always thought. And so I love listening to Junior Kimbrough, Arl Burnside. <laughs> Thanks honey. Um, from the other room. So that was black earth. Uh, we named the school after that. Um, black earth is the word um, alchemy comes from, the land of black earth. And so alchemy, a lot of people toss that word around. It's like they <clears throat> toss around the word spirituality or whatever. Um, but these things are very important, but they don't mean one thing. Um, alchemy as a transformation process includes seven steps. And we could probably look at this um, Easter tale of uh, the uh, crucifixion and resurrection in terms of alchemy, but alchemy, is a part of the creative process as a composer. Um, it's, it's, it's fun to think about what you're engaging with there. And a lot of people on their spiritual path and in their creative process get stuck <clears throat> just on steps three or four because they don't know that there's seven steps. Step three is a separatio. We could say that the US of A might be in a process of uh, they're just stuck there. A lot of people are stuck there. I would really like to not talk about um, politics. So let's move right over to the piece called Woodmaster, which is my dedication to Ken Lacoste, who made these flutes, these big flutes. And as we discussed last week, Ken uh, passed away last June. He left his body. He's on to other things. <clears throat> And before that happened, luckily, we got him on a concert with us, us meaning the embryonic Heavy Roots Shakachi Ensemble. And um, he, we, we did this great improvisation called the Glorious Great Horned Owl on a bunch of flutes that he had just finished uh, last May. And um, I also premiered this piece at that concert and dedicated it to him. And it was kind of funny because I was saying this just like I'm talking about it now. And I was, you know, I was... Um, probably complimenting his prowess and making these great flutes that changed a lot of our lives. Sharp Hachi is one thing, but these time who are a, a whole nother thing. And um, thanks, Nicholas. I know he's got two, maybe three time. Um, 
and he uh, he he he, uh, he was I think stunned that all of a sudden I was talking about him from the stage, and he he, he was um, he what he didn't move or blink for a while. So that was kind of funny. Um, but you never you never know. You dedicate something to somebody out of the blue. How 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 they feel? Maybe they're put on the spot. Anyway, this is a tribute piece. Obviously, there's some uh, there's some riffs, and some blues uh, uh, influence in here, but it's all bamboo gospel. This is Woodmaster.
Okay, missing uh, Ken Lacoste. Uh, actually, three days ago, uh, or April 9th, was his 60th birthday. And yeah, a life well lived. Uh, April 9th is also when, I think in Japan, they sort of put Buddha's birthday there. Um, in other Buddhist countries, it moves around because it's like a lunar, on a lunar cycle. And April 7th happens to be my, what we call Shakuversary, which means that uh, that's the day I got my first flute. Um, uh, on April 7th of just last year. I've been playing for uh, just a little over a year now. That's the humor. I guess the humor on the digital thing you do, I guess I, I don't really register people laugh at what I say anyway, because I'm not, I'm not in the com comedy profession, but uh, uh, it was 2001. That was my first flute. That flute came from Ken Mujitsu Lacoste through a school I was teaching at in Chicago called the Old Town School of Folk Music which I nicknamed the Old Town School of Beginning Guitar Class because that was mostly the bread and butter, but it was actually an amazing place. They've continued to grow. Excuse me, YouTube crowd. I'm gonna go over to the Facebook crowd and um, it just tells me who's watching. Hey, thanks, Philip. I think it's Philip Gelb's birth big brother. Um, um, yeah, Philip is uh, making food for people in Oakland. So if you're in Oakland or Berkeley, Make sure you keep up with what he's making because he's making food and it's delicious. Sometimes we have to live with these internal contradictions. Um, so rolling back the clock, uh, a lot of you know that I composed 27 pieces for these big flutes. These are called Taimu. Brian uh, Tairaku Ritchie and Ken Lacoste came up with this design, wider bore, bigger holes, uh, no lacquer, no insert up here. Um, and this is, this is what a lot of us really love, these particular design uh, decisions and the different sounds you can get. For those of you just joining us, this is a bass uh, shakuhachi called Taimu. And when I make sounds such as the following, or uh, those are not only on purpose, but highly desirable. And this builds the link not just back to uh, distorted electric guitar and sort of uh, grittier bottleneck guitar, um, electric or acoustic, uh, but also some of the vocal styles of whether it's blues or rock or gospel. Blind Willie Johnson, like I mentioned earlier, let's do a little product placement here for Blind Willie. That's probably like the only picture of them. That's the great thing about these. At least a lot of these men and women were recorded, uh, but it, it might have taken another couple decades to find a picture. So that's the complete right there. And he sings. He sings a lot in this. Um, what we later find out would be like a kind of a throat singing variant. But at the time, most of us knew this kind of voice from the character Froggy on the Little Rascals or Our Gang. <laughs> So I suspect that that was a way to project your voice. The tubins are, are cowboys and they're projecting while they're riding around on their horses. And um, Blind Willie Johnson and Blind Lemon Jefferson were street musicians in, the, in Texas. And I suspect with no amplification, you would kind of do uh, some kind of gravelly multiphonic projection. So uh, often I try to get cool distorted and textured sounds on here. We find them really expressive. Etta James is another great example of just smooth, incredible transition from clean voice to, to, to gritty, gravelly voice. And secretly most instrumentalists want to be a singer through our instrument. This piece is called A Taste of Nothing, which brings us back to Buddhism. No thingness. And since Zen is really about the distillation of no thingness, I think I will say nothing else. You play the taste of nothing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. That was uh, one of the first pieces I wrote for the big flutes after completing um, a set of compositions that I called Mu Kyoku, which was um, Kyoku sometimes gets used as just this ending meaning songs from Hong Kyoku is original or inner songs and that's the Zen repertoire we learned. And um, there was a book that talked about So Kyoku meaning a different variant on some of that repertoire. And at the time I started writing pieces for Tai Mu and Mu is a kind of a whole uh, philosophical concept of um, uh, the void and emptiness, not emptiness like uh, the kind where everything's missing, but the complete real emptiness that contains everything in nothingness. You can see where duality starts to fall apart pretty fast. But uh, so I completed those pieces of which the next one I'm going to play is a very rarely performed sort of epic length, the final piece, the 27th piece. Now, I picked 27 because there were 36 honkyoku, allegedly, although there's actually way more than that, but that's what you read when you're a beginner. There's 36 in this Zen repertoire. That's four times nine. I like the number three and, and three times three times three. That's 27. And I told Ken, I said, hey, it's your flutes, but I'm going to write these pieces to, uh, to celebrate these flutes, and it's what these flutes want to play and help people learn these bigger flutes that have a lot of challenge for holding them, generating tone. Uh, it, somehow, for him, the number was good because it has something to do with baseball. Runs batted in, I think, was what the term he used. So it was a win-win. So there were 27 pieces of which uh, this was the 27th. The title doesn't necessarily fit the spirit of the piece, but I've been holding on to this term. Oh, hey, thanks, Bonnie. Uh, Shak the monkey. Uh, so Shakyamuni Buddha is uh, Prince Gautama's uh, name, the Buddha's name, historical Buddha's uh, name, Shakyamuni. And uh, Peter Gabriel featured uh, Shakuhachi in, um, in uh, one of the songs, uh, Sledgehammer, maybe, yeah. And 
he had another hit before that, of course, called Sh Shock the Monkey. And so, and Shakuhachi has the S-H-A-K at the beginning. So there are all these uh, confluences that spelling Shock the Monkey is S-H-A-K-T-H-A-M-U-N-K-I. I thought it was funny. I kept it around. I wanted to use it somewhere. I slapped it on this tune that was this um, uh, basic uh, blues, specifically with the concept of your kind of uh, it's sunset and you're you're done um, dealing with whatever the crop is and, and the hot sun for the whole day. And a lot of people can relate to this. You don't have to have been um, dealing with cotton in the South, but that's where a lot of blues personas trace their origin. And so any kind of uh, peaceful respite that, that uses music as, as a way to get back to this vertical dimension after being out in the horizontal, uh, busy, labyrinthine, confusing and deceptive world, um, that's the spirit of this. So the form is not song-like per se. It's a kind of a, it's a kind of a rambling of uh, blues riff isms, and uh, they happen to go well um, together. And it's five pages long, and it looks like this. This is the notation for those of you who are so. Here's you guys can all get a screenshot. You get a pro bono page two of Shock the Monkey, which is a level three piece. Hey, hey, Michael McCamish, good to see you. Um, <laughs> um, emptiness is an endless topic discussion. So this is a, this is something I don't have memorized. So here we go. This is our uh, long, and this is on Sacred Root, the last album I released last year. Taste of Nothing was on Holy Flute, which was which was way back. And uh, I don't know about that, Bob. Um, you can help me come up with a name. Yeah. Jeff Cherry Garfield. I don't know. Bob, I think we'll have to play that game after, after the set, or I'm going to be thinking about it. Okay. But this also has three parts to the name of the song, I guess. So um, here we go. Shock the Monkey. I want to perform this live, I think, one other time, and that was in 2011. <laughs>
to a porch blues ramble um, and like I said like I said before this is all notated so some of the um, 
project, I would say, of writing new solo unaccompanied pieces for larger shakuhachi flutes. Uh, there's a lot of factors um, to it, but part of it is not sacrificing the freedom and the flow of essentially pulseless music that Honkyoku is based in. We don't have a beat, no conductor, no drummer, no um, homunculus of a drummer or a conductor going in your mind, which is uh, the approach for a lot of my pieces. Uh, that there's there's a there's a living uh, rhythm section inside that I'm playing along with. Um, that was the case on a couple sections of that piece, but um, in general, this this freedom of as if it's improvised, um, but it is actually a set form and structure that deepens for the player as a practice almost as both a consciousness, breath, and performative instrumental practice that really deepens over time, uh, mixing pulse with free sections and having things based mostly on the breath. Um, a, few, a few, few extended riffs in there with maybe some circular breathing. Um, so, the piece Black Earth I started with, I submitted that to some music blogs before the album came out. That's also on Sacred Root, like this one, even though they're written years apart. Uh, and one of the music blogs said, well, this, this is more of kind of an improvisation. We're looking for actual songs. So I actually took that, that was a rejection, but I thought that was kind of a compliment because uh, it does sound very free, a lot of these pieces, but they're um, composed. and I feel like there's a lot of benefit to that. Let's go over to the screens and see who's hanging around. Okay, sometimes I've all right, Nate Johnson. Wow, it's it's when you get the 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 fellow monster musicians attending your digital online concert that ups that ups the uh, the bar. Let's say, not to mention all your um, students. So. We're talking about PVC over there, not my bag. Hey, there's a monkey. Nice, Christopher. Like seeing monkeys on the side. Anytime you can put monkeys on a computer screen, do it. That's what I always say. Um, so like last week, we'll probably do a little q and People want to stick around um, afterwards. There's the stout, um, but the tea is part of, you know, maybe maybe since it's Easter, maybe we shouldn't have any booze. We'll just stick with tea. Wink. Um, it's just a topic that everybody can relate to. I find that as a musician, when you're out, if you start talking about booze, you make friends. That's just been my experience. If you start talking about Zen, you, you sow confusion. Um, so let's have one more blues uh, recommendation before the next number. This fellow is a, a, many of you probably know him, Corey Harris. So this album is his solo unaccompanied album. It's got originals, it's got classic tunes, got some great blind Willie Johnson on there. Um, Corey is still around. He continues to make um, really, he's sort of an anthropologist slash um, very authentic uh folklorist, blues, blues man, let's say, but his scope at this point goes well beyond just uh, Delta, Delta blues and he's still active. So the reason I wanted to mention him is he's, he's doing live stream concerts on Instagram tomorrow and Wednesday. I'm, I don't have an Instagram, so I might have to get on that just so I can watch his concerts. He does have a few on his Facebook page though. So that's C-O-R-E-Y-H-A-R-R-I-S. And he has some recent live stream concerts. So if you want to uh, hear the string and voice side of, uh, like, let's call it Super Roots uh, Blues performance, head over to Corey Harris's Facebook page. And that album, Between Midnight and Day, if you buy it, uh, I guarantee you will listen to it very regularly. The next piece is um, called The Demiurge Takes Form. And um, 
Uh, yeah, Peter. Oh, yeah, Peter. I met Peter. Peter played with my teacher in um, San Francisco some years ago at Old First Church. That's where we were supposed to play last week. Uh, Peter is also a monster shahachi player. Um, and there's a, there's a lot more of us than you think. So tell your friends, tell a friend about shakuhachi this week, why don't you? Um, I call it the grand archetype of woodwinds. There's there's no parts, there's no reed, there's no mouthpieces. And um, after this piece, maybe I'll go into it a little bit, how I transitioned from bass clarinet to just this. But if you guys can hear that, somebody's running a vacuum cleaner out in the, out in the woods. Um, all right, yeah, okay, good. Andrew Lloyd Westhoff is it. So we Swamp Thing Blues, uh, that's kind of the mindset here. Um, it's just about getting back to the roots. Um, and this is vertical, and these are, these are roots, by the way. For those of you who aren't familiar, these kind of come out. This is all part of the uh, mycorrhizal network in the ground. So it's a really hard work to harvest these pieces. And I know it sounds funny to say for those of us who already know, but you know these nodes were how it grew. It's not like the flute maker decided, let's put a node here, put a hole here. Uh, it, this is an actual piece of bamboo. I'm saying this not because some of you don't know, but when I was a newbie 19 years ago, I had to realize this stuff. You know, this is this is a piece of grass, woody grass, it grew out of the ground. It's got this dimension. It's already hollow except for these nodes being filled in. It's got these nodes. You know, bamboo is a kind of a mysterious, miraculous whole deal. Um, and there is no other instrument that has melodic capabilities that is still structured the way that it grew uh, out of the ground. Um, Oh, Alberto, I think that you're taking the wrong approach. Shakuhachi is, um, well, it depends on what you say about it, I guess. And you can always say, um, but enough about Shakuhachi. What do you think about Shakuhachi? So this is the Demiurge takes form. This is uh, ideally played very slow. I've, I've never performed it on this uh, flute. This is a little bit lower. That, that flute was a low note of G. This is an F. So we're going to do a couple tunes on this bigger flute, I think. And I think it's funny I don't have this memorized yet. Some of my students do. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, that that I would call somewhat of a dirge uh, blues, and that's sort of the title. The demiurge um, is part of a cult practice, and uh, in a way, every song uh, we make, uh, singer songwriters or composers or uh, other people creating pieces of music, our relationship to a piece of music is like making. Uh, Demiurge, of which of one version the famous would be the monster of Dr. Frankenstein, but of course he was uh, he was consciously playing God a little bit more than maybe uh, other occult practitioners, which just maybe needed a little friend, you know, not necessarily um, having power over life and death in that way. Uh, let's raise a glass to Mary Shelley. Um, so. Uh, taking form, uh, taking or taking form, like becoming a form. Uh, so I like to play with words and titles. Uh, so I'm gonna take a little break. That was a little bit of a stretch. Let's go to the let's go to the questions. This is like a <laughs> wow. Everybody's shy about discussing woodwind instruments. It seems to be here. Uh, mm hmm. That's right. Well, the only, yeah, the only thing that ups the ante in your uh, bamboo gospel set is, uh, other than musicians that are of a high caliber, is your, your Zen teacher popping in here. Um, and um, especially when you're a little behind on your studies. But it's great to see everybody here um, in the virtual form. I'm going to stick with that big flute, actually. And um, there's two more pieces for those of you just joining us. Um, today's set is brought to you by the letter O. No, uh, today's set is uh, Bamboo Gospel is the name I gave to these pieces that were written for the big, big flutes that are influenced by early um, gospel and rural blues in my mind and musically. Like I talked about last week, 
musicians that are deep into their practice, um, everything, not, not, almost nothing's off the table. So for those of you who aren't musicians who are decades into a practice, uh, it might surprise you how, ma how many influences are in, in play when you write a piece, which makes it all the more difficult for what we call marketing because you have to slap a label on it. Um, that's the separatio we talked about earlier. Uh, but that's not, that's not really that fun. Boundaries and limits are not that fun for a composer. This piece is called The Mysteries of Harmony and Focus. And in a way, that's one way of summing up what we're doing here, Zen Shakachi. But I also stole it from uh, that Kung Fu character, uh, Shifu character in Kung Fu Panda. Um, all right, hello everybody on Facebook. We've got two audiences going. Thanks everyone for sticking around. And all that bamboo gospel talk was to say, it's conscious that there's not a lot of variety here. We're sticking with one um, harmonic vocabulary and really exploring that, putting all these pieces together. Whereas originally I wrote these to drop in in the midst of other pieces like I did last week. I did about three of these pieces because they're kind of my personal favorite to play. And then some small flute stuff, some honkyoku zen stuff um, like that. So the small flute only makes an appearance at the very tail end of today. And that's two more pieces away. This one and then uh, green swampy water. <clears throat> and of course, some more tea so that it's ready. I'll share another little story with you while we're on a break because I've got the props right here. How do you know when your conscious awareness is too aware of the details of your Yoda action figure friend? Well, I can tell you when you suddenly spot something outside on the ground and you know it has a, a purpose, and this is this is this acorn, uh, what, what turned out to be a, the perfect acorn toque for, for Yoda. And I recognized that it was sitting on the ground and I knew that it had a purpose. I didn't know what yet, but I picked it up and there it is. So, you know, normally if you were going to seek out an acorn toque for any of your action figures, you would have to take measurements and, um, you know, really pay attention, do a little, a lot of seeking around. It did, it did arise just for him. And, um, so that's an example of what we might call um, intuitive intelligence. Um, well, thank you very much, Jim. Is that possibly James Orbit, Simon? Just write the word nutty again, if that's true. Um, it's great. It's great to see some of these uh, personas popping out of the woodwork. It's all about wood and the mysteries.
The Mysteries of Harmony and Focus. Polyflutter, that's a great word. See, I should have been in touch. These terms, uh, yeah, harmonic distortion, uh, texture, turbulence, um, yeah, texture is the main theme here. And I'm really happy to see that Mr. James Orbit Simon has joined us and totally gets it. It is an F, it's a 2-9, so it's pretty wide. Um, so it's this width to length ratio that Ken and Brian were messing with. Um, so if it gets much wider than this, the octave doesn't overblow it in tune. And um, so he really pushed, tried to push that ratio. How he tuned it to the minor pentatonic scale, which is the five holes we have in Shakuhachi, when the dimensions were not of the same ratio as other flutes, I'm, I've never been quite sure. And a lot of people who aren't adapted to playing these sort of monsters, uh, they may pick them up and they may play some way that doesn't really suit them. And they may play something like, and then they might go, It's, it's, um, it sounds like crap and it's out of tune. Well, that's what we call in the acoustic woodwind world uh, user error. And magic, yes, it is, it is magic. Um, great, it's so great to have all the supporters here. Not that at my live shows, the audience isn't generally supportive as well. Um, in fact, I think that having a heckler or two uh, now and again could, uh, you know, it could spice things up. Um, it's, it's because at least they're there in person. It's not like the thumbs down on YouTube, which is totally anonymous. Um, anonymous. Anonymous. Okay, so careening into the end here, I did all my blues album recommendations for everybody. Let's do the book recommendations as we, as we slide into the final piece. 
those of you that are curious about the invisible realm, now let me point out here if I was doing a sermon um, today, which I'm not doing a verbal sermon, uh, we would talk about um, the invisible world. Music is 100% invisible. You can see visible effects through resonance and vibration. But nobody has seen or held uh, a music. And so this I find significant. There are other things that are invisible that are very important on the good and the bad side of life. Um, so there's a lot more going on that we can't see or measure. And if you're curious about that world in a really next level way, and um, there might be some of you who are on here, I do recommend to delve into Mr. Marko uh, Pogacnik, his book, he's Slovenian. I'm not sure how to describe that. So this was his experience in the 90s, contacting uh, nature spirits and elemental beings. He is a sculptor and invented uh, lithopuncture, which is fixing uh, energy flows in landscapes by placing uh, stones. Oh, this is Facebook people need to see the book here. Uh, there we go, nature spirits and elemental beings. And um, it is a trip. That book is a real, is a real trip, but it, it, it explains a lot more of what's been going on in the background, why some of us feel certain pulls to a certain relationship to nature that is simply not part of rational, so-called rational society. If you can show me rational results from the so-called rational thinking that's been trending for the last 400 years, I would love to see those rational results. I don't believe they're common. Now, this book is another hidden gem here, Hidden Nature. By uh, It's all about Victor Schauberger. Now, this guy is incredibly uh, undersung. Um, it, it, it'll really blow your mind. It's a lot less esoteric and out there than this, but it's, it's super involved. He knows all about water. He knows all about spirals. And the way that nature works is through vortices and spirals. And this is sort of like if you know about Nikolai Tesla, this guy is sort of the next level uh, nature version. So this, is, this all has to do with how we can get energy from the atmosphere. And anyway, he's, he's from many years ago. Um, there'll be something interesting there for everybody. Something for everybody. Nature books and blues albums. So, yeah, he's but he's misunderstood. That's that's true. That sounds like a different uh, German philosopher's name. Uh, yeah, sure. So that's it. This is five, three, three albums and two books. And if you missed the recommendations, you can roll back the tape. Golden Mean. Yeah, it's all. Oh, uh, I don't have this album in here. I've played a lot of shows with this fellow named Mark Deutsch, and. Um, I do recommend uh, his album. I'm always returning to his album. It's 20 years old now. It's just called Fool. He invented an instrument called the Byzantar. Um, a lot of you already know about him because I played a lot of shows with him for many years. Um, get that album, Fool. Listen to it. Um, it'll fix your, um, um, what's this called? Um, mental imbalances, let's just say. All right, this is Green Swampy Water. If Andrew Lloyd Westhoff is still over there on the Facebook device. He uh, masterminded and directed a great uh, music video, my one and only music video that's on YouTube, and we filmed it out here in the woods, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So I got one more song, and then we'll have, uh, we'll have the Q&A for people that feel like sticking around and uh, see if, if, if we're going to have a frosty beverage or just more tea, but certainly questions. After this concert, I'm not sure when my next online concert will be, or if it will be on YouTube or just on Facebook. Uh, I'm open to suggestions. I am thinking about offering free Zoom masterclasses on topics that people are interested in. Uh, and those might be like Mondays at noon, probably not starting tomorrow, but uh, just because there's a lot of topics that come up with a lot of people that are fun to, to explore and talk about. And um, that's something I'm considering uh, doing, but that, that would be like through the, the Zoom invite um, 
kind of thing. But that way we would have more interaction, which this is a very one way kind of a thing. Well, it's, it's one plus a little bit because I can read you guys, you girls. Here are read swampy water, big finish.
Uh, it looks like this recorder wasn't recording, but that's okay. We got it on YouTube. <laughs> All right, look at those extra figures over there. So um, that song is on the second Shabbatchi Unleashed album called Bamboo Rising. Um, and before everybody um, takes off or we, we transition to the Q&A for like a couple, 10 or 20 minutes, uh, I wanted to really thank uh, those of you that sent in the PayPal ticket admission slash contribution donation. Um, I'm keeping track of everybody and um, I'm going to send out some like, uh, what would we call them, like door prizes or uh, party favors um, in the email, which will and maybe include more of either some bonus tracks that were, that were part of the albums, uh, the album funding campaigns. And also um, what I wanted to send everyone was a little document I called Breathing Bibliography. There's a lot more people teaching and talking about conscious breathing uh, and, and the health and psychological benefits than there used to be. But um, years ago, I started putting together a little bibliography of the books I have that help people understand how vital breathing is. You'd think we would have a little intuition about that, but we kind of tend to take that for granted taking for granted that's that's that let's write that down that's going to be our first zoom session no that's not that's sort of an endless topic all right hey thanks everybody <laughs> Andy. all right this is like uh this is like a, a party with digital screens and people that i haven't talked to for a long time this is wonderful um it is a little bit of a strange uh time in, on planet Earth, but I guess when is it not? Um, hey, thanks, thanks, Ben. We'll use that. That's a good tagline. So I realized that if I didn't look at these uh, little comments over here, they kind of disappear. Um, and then and Jane, and then what happens around this time is uh, Mr. Simon said uh, Nutty Buddy, and that reminded me of Nutty Buddies. If you guys remember that they were like sort of pre-made frozen ice cream cones with a layer of thick chocolate and nuts on top. So we always start talking about food because it's like post lunchtime now. Um, beer and food become the topics. Um, and like I said last time, if anybody has my phone number, you can call. Uh, only my phone's being used for Facebook now. So um, let's see. Who has, a, who has a good question? I'll see the, I'll, I'll answer the first question that comes up here. Oh, I was talking about donations. Yeah, so PayPal cb at corneliusboots.com. That's the email. Use that email for suggestions for the next concert, either repertoire or format, because I'm not 100% sold on the quality of the YouTube version here, mostly because if anybody out there works for YouTube, I know some of you do, uh, uh, I can't get into this, to this uh, control panel on my phone if I set up a an event beforehand. So that's kind of a flaw. So if I do YouTube, it'll probably be just kind of out of the blue and there won't be a link beforehand. You just kind of, it'll appear out of the ether. Same with Facebook, I guess. <laughs> um, and also for, for PayPal donations for this concert and the last concert, or if you had um, some music you wanted to buy, um, like any of the CDs or sheet music, some of that's on the web page, but you could just sort of come up with uh, what you want and send some uh, budget in through PayPal. And I really appreciate anyone doing that. Of course, everybody's got to keep their own counsel on their their budget. So this is not a, uh, a paid event. However, you know, we buy groceries and so everything's uh, appreciated. And I will be sending out to everybody um, something in the email. So I'm a little bit thirsty. Clint, always happy to share. Let's see here. So everybody's very quiet today. Last time we talked a lot about, um, I don't remember, beer and pancakes. That's what we talked about. Polyflutter, I really like that term. Um, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, let's hydrate. That's a good question. See, that's all it takes. Is that so hard? Thanks, Christopher. Now, Christopher 
I think put a little symbol up here of some water earlier. He's a surfer, and I really like making uh, comparisons between surfing or kayaking and what we do on Shakuhachi because it is about the flow and being in it, uh, both horizontal and the, the vertical. Um, let's see. Thanks. <laughs> I thought I thought you didn't know what pancakes were there in France. Um, that seems like a funny question. What's more important, the inhale or the exhale? Uh, but that's that 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 is a good question. And you'd think that the exhale is more important when you're playing a wind instrument. In a way, it's true because you're shaping the exhale, and that's the entire craft. In a way, where where breath benders. If you have seen uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Everybody's got an element, firebenders and airbenders, where breathbenders. And um, the best example of that in movies is when Gandalf makes that uh, boat out of pipe smoke. Um, so we're manipulating the exhale. But if you don't inhale uh, down next to the big muscles down here, this is why I, I got these funny turtlenecks so you can see what's happening. That's the inhale right there. Oh, this is this is great. This is a very exaggerated. Yeah. So that's not a beer belly. That's just air. Although we could we could try to add to it. That's great. It looks a lot bigger than what it feels like. But um, the best thing is also to inhale back to here if you can. And then the air is next to all these muscles. And that gives you power. <laughs> Everybody's laughing. Um, so you got to inhale to the lowest part of the lungs. Let's do a let's do a brief breathing tutorial spiel for everybody. How many people have heard of gravity? Good. So the lungs are filled with little alveoli, little sacs, but they are also as a whole. These are not just like big empty containers, but they're still affected by gravity, which a lot of people don't realize. And so if you divide the lungs, which go all the way through, you know, I mean, your rib cage covers your whole lungs. So they're huge. This is a, your lungs are huge. Oh, well, I'll explain later. That, that was also the joke last week when I mentioned Christ. And somebody said, who? Um, Christ and gravity go together today. Um, so if we divide the lungs into thirds, lower third, middle, upper third, where do you think uh, the most blood is circulating? Not here. It's it's in the lower third of the lungs because of gravity. So if you don't breathe, if you breathe up here, a clavicular breath or an upper chest breath, like, um, it feels funny, and 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 you can already just tell that instigates something like anxiety. And that we can do that because you might need quick oxygen that's running from the saber-toothed tiger. And so the upper third of the lungs has the least amount of blood circulating, a teacup's worth each minute. Whereas the lower third of the lungs has uh, like a liter of blood circulating each minute. So not only is it for a wind player not gonna get you close to the big muscles that are really how we support the tone, but it's not going to get you good oxygen to brain transfer. And this is my postulate of the, the global, um, let's say, a parallel. I, I shouldn't use the word pandemic because that's actually happening. But it's a, it's, a, it's a global affliction that our brain needs more oxygen than what most people are, are doing it because studies have been done for 20 or 30 years, anybody past the age of about 10 or 11 is primarily breathing into the uh, upper third of their lungs only, not even the middle, not even the solar plexus right next to the diaphragm itself um, or right above it. So here's the advice. Your breath, not only is it better if you can consciously breathe for a couple minutes a day, just three conscious breaths would be good. Most people can't do it because they might go like this and, and hold it or fill up their chest or hold it. That's not really going to help. It gives you a lot of anxiety. The breathing needs to be lower 
slower, quieter, and more regular. So there's an example right there. That was only two breaths. So that's the advice for now. You might notice um, quite a bit of clarity that comes in. That's the oxygen in the brain. Um, it, with breathing exercises, always use the nose. That's the other thing. That's the, um, it's the, for, for wind players, we have to use the mouth because you get more air faster. Uh, when the music is pulsed. If it's non-pulsed music, you have the option to go use uh, nose inhale if we, if we want to. Um, but when you're doing like breath exercises, there's also a lot of uh, breath retention or breath holding. I personally don't recommend that. Try instead to link up with this kind of, this kind of shape, your inhale to your exhale and, and on the other side as well, because there is a moment when it'll flip. But if you can make that a rounded moment, that's really fun. And when you're consciously breathing, don't do too much holding of the breath. That's that's for other people's um, other people's um, methods. You know, it's like pranayama or something. So there's the breathing. This is the breathing sermon. I think it's time to grab the stop. Bonnie had a question. I see that. Yeah. Let's see here. Do we have? Yeah, good question, Bonnie. McCavity and Hoovity. We got a lot of comedians on here, but then again, you know, we uh Hey, thanks, David. Have a great Easter dinner. Easter dinner. Anybody else having Easter dinner? Um here's the thing about scales. Uh, Bonnie asked about our musical scale. So Japanese scales are actually really hard for us to play on chagahachi. So according to me um, at first, because this has five holes, one, two, three, four, five. And that scale, the minor pentatonic uh, with one note added is what we call in the Western music, the blues scale, even though there's more than one blues scale. And so today I was featuring pieces that I wrote focusing on that scale, which was already my focus before I even knew chagahachi existed. It's a distilled uh, five note scale that is all over um, gospel, blues, jazz, folk music. Other kinds of global folk musics use other five note scales that are very similar to it. So pentatonic, meaning five tones. Um, it, and, and the big flutes, if you can get anything happening on them, it's like a celebration. So wanting to just stick with those notes and not the in between stuff which you get with a combination of head movement, breath modulation, and uh, uh, finger, uh, finger partial cover. Those notes are, for beginners, um, like a real challenge. So to answer your question, Bonnie, yeah, um, in the folk songs, sometimes you'll get just a major scale, like we have a lot of. And that's a major pentatonic. So that's starting on the no the notes I have not if another uh, musicologist, other people on here probably already know the answer. But I do know that there are similar five note scales or six note scales, but with more half steps, more tension ratios, uh, intervals rather. So this is one of our very typical scales for the Zen pieces. <laughs> and it's sort of cousin scale has shows two notes and then shifts one of the intervals so both of those are five note scales there are different five notes than the what I call native Shagamachi scale. So you get folk songs and Zen pieces using um, mostly those more um, Japanese scales. I was already using those five note scales before I knew that they were all over the place in 
of Japanese music. So some of the folk songs you might be familiar with, Bonnie might use those scales. So uh, it wasn't the plan to play any Japanese folk songs or lullabies also use some of these scales like and that are are common and that's a real attraction to me the seven and uh, and even eight note scales of western music and advanced jazz uh, playing. I don't know if uh, Nate Johnson is still on here or James Simon is on here, but those uh, fellows know um, how deep it gets in jazz theory that there are essentially endless scales. <clears throat> that is, I think, Edo no Komori Uta. And uh, yeah, it's just, it just gets mind boggling. So that's your, that's your John Coltrane um, kind of realm there with all these complicated scales. But uh, so I like five note scales when I write for the bass clarinet and solo bass clarinet piece that I wrote called The Sacred Teaching of the Lonely Goose that has uh, three movements. Each of those movements, I picked a five note scale. I'm pretty much stuck with that. And in, um, in Western music, there is a pull or a push towards complexity. So all the pieces I played today uh, might be in, in, within certain crowds uh, looked down on for being overly simplified. Oh, he's just using those same five notes, big whoop. Uh, that's the appeal of um, blues to me and other um, limited, so-called limited vocabulary. Once you have that, then you have your, you have less parameters and more juice, so to speak, for expression and freedom. Um, according to me. And for a solo woodwind performance practice, I like these five note scales a lot. So I think there's a lot to explore there. Uh huh. Okay. Henry's over there. And um, yeah, good, Bonnie. Um, yeah, so there's probably other scales that I don't know about. And if Kevin's still on here, maybe Kevin wants to talk about what are the scales in Gagaku? <laughs> Um, I certainly don't know. Um, there was at least one other question. Oh, Felicia can breathe through her eyes. Um, we have a piece called SOCON that is breath sight or breath vision. Um, and if Dan Spriggs is on here now, I don't know what time it is in Australia. That might be the one place where it's really past their bedtime to be watching here. Um, so... That's right. I was going to say that, Mr. Simon. Although I remembered him talking about one note. That's the thing. You limit, you know, David Baker, who was our, our uh, sort of, well, he is the jazz pedagogy guru and uh, really pointed that out, that you, that you, the more you limit your vocabulary, uh, the more the, the creativity has to go up. So you, the, the less material and vocabulary you have to work with, that the higher your creative prowess needs to rise. And that is certainly uh, one way to sum up the appeal of Shaguhachi. Um, and there's another thing that I was to remember, and I told somebody else recently about uh, David Baker's jazz improvisation class, where he, it was a real uh, great moment for me as a teacher. I still don't really do this. Um, but it seemed like a lot of fun. Then he would get players in those classes, jazz improvisation from all over the school. And we, we went to Indiana University, which is a, um, a really deep uh, music conservatory style school, but at a state college in Indiana. And so you'd get um, people that just played, maybe played a little guitar or whatever, thinking that sounds interesting, jazz improvisation. They'd sign up for the class. And then um, David would sit at the piano and say, okay, major scales around the circle of fifths. And he would play, and he couldn't play piano that well, but he would play two octaves of the major scale and this, and then go to the next scale. Circle of fifths means all 12 keys back to back, all your key signatures. And so he would do that maybe two or three weeks and, and then the whole class would get thinned out to a lot of people would drop. And then, and then it would just be the people who, could keep up at that level. 
meaning it wasn't a way to be mean, but just a way to sort of set that the bar isn't actually starting at, at not knowing your, 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 your scales. You already have to kind of be into the vocabulary of your instrument. And then uh, this is where we were going to be picking things up. But then after all those people dropped, we would do uh, for week four, five, and six, a bunch of just blues stuff that has a, that has a very limited vocabulary and, and switch to that more sort of what I consider free um, melodic exploratory expression. And um, so I don't know if that was, I, I'm sure that was in, intentional. Uh, let's see here. What does Lamont say, AKA Clint? Do you feel that it's difficult to make pieces sound different from each other yet keep them simple? Um, well, not, yeah, I guess so. Um, I try to not write too much material at one time. A lot of the riffs and structures that are sort of coming in uh, tend, tend to be similar in close proximity, So, um, or so I thought. But there are lines in uh, Taste of Nothing written in 2014, real similar riffs to Woodmaster that I just wrote last year. And so um, to me, that's that's not something so much to shy away from because I feel like that if it feels organic and it feels natural, uh, then it can still be part of the piece, even if it really overlaps with another piece that already exists. Um, and that's certainly true for riffs. And in a way, back to my music school training, we had a view of the composition department there. There was a fellow named Frederick Fox, and he did his final concert and final uh, orchestra composition performance before he retired. And one of my teachers said uh, that he thinks he finally got got it right finally and i could kind of hear that and i i personally am uh, an advocate of like a personal style like a consistent personal style with variety baked in um but i don't really so much enjoy just this is just personal i don't enjoy concerts necessarily let's say a chamber group where they're just sort of showing you their eclecticism it's sort of all over the all over the shop in terms of really generating a feeling or a, a new experience of a new realm. And this is why I feel like the world of rock has been very, very good at, which is um, how to create your own voice as an ensemble and say something unique. It's consistent and that you're evolving it. And so that's, that's a challenge. That's what a lot of us are, are up to. That's a good question. Oh, the circular breathing. Um, yeah, that's a good topic. Um, that's for lessons or maybe for the zoom calls, uh, circular breathing is a lot of fun and, um, I think everybody should do it. You don't need a straw. You don't need uh, water to blow bubbles into, but you do need to provide a lot of resistance. And for those of you who didn't know I was circular breathing when I was playing, you don't need, uh, you don't need, um, <laughs> to a vein. he's everywhere. Um, you don't need to puff your cheeks on flutes. We generate our own resistance. Circular breathing relies on a brief moment of breathing out from the mouth cavity while the, while the inhale is going from the nose down to the lungs. So it's going in here and out there. <clears throat> uh, you don't need much air uh, if, if the resistance is high. Uh, if, the resist if this is really open, <sighs> then you lose air fast. That's not enough time to get an inhale. The reeds, it's not the lip opening combined with the mouthpiece pressure like it would be on didgeridoo and brass instruments. And of course, singers can't circular breathe. It's not, it's not part of the setup. So on flutes, we have an opportunity to start working on circular breathing and improve the efficiency and focus of the embouchure, which is the lip opening. So. You just can keep an exhale going. It's from a very small opening. And this is how I was taught in a master class with the great Lenny Pickett, which is just put your hand pretty close, keep the air hitting this spot, which in Qigong we call it Lao Gong. And so it's a sensitive spot. And you just keep the air on there. And so you can walk around and do, you can puff the cheeks or not puff the cheeks. So that's the brief the brief version. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, 
Let's get some more creative questions. Let's do like one or two more. I haven't even opened the style yet. Um, hey, Mr. Mr. Young. Good to see everyone here. Oh yeah, so what Nicholas is pointing out over there is the challenge is that it messes with your tone, right? So if you start doing stuff inside and you were getting a good sound on your instrument, whether it's saxophone or, or tuba or shakuhachi, to do the exhale, inhale simultaneously can throw off the whole balance of the fact that, you, that you're, you've already worked so hard to get the setup going to make your best sound. And um, I say that's part of the fun. And so because I do it sort of surreptitiously, meaning even I, if I watch my videos back, I can't tell. I, I forget that I'm circular breathing. So let's just take a moment to have a real conscious circular breathing uh, moment. And let's just have me play um, two notes uh, back and forth for a while with, with no break and just see what you can see. And you can watch the whole this is why we have this special day glow. Um, if we had the black light, when it gets later, we'll turn the black light on. very surreptitious but it's also very relaxing so here's the final word uh, for now on circular breathing there's there's uh, rumblings always amongst uh, woodwind communities people who are in positions of uh, authority within certain woodwind communities sometimes speak out against the practice of circular breathing why primarily jealousy and the fact that they can't do it or they can't do it that well um, but what they will say um, externally is that it is anathema to breath-based phrasing, which of course is true. Um, if you're playing melodies and you're um, taking the, the role of like a vocalist, melodies need to be about our current uh, melody-obsessed uh, role that woodwind players have been uh, sort of um, limited into. Melodies are great. Singing is great. You can see that my big influences are often vocalists. However, other influences are uh, other instruments, such as electric guitar, slide guitar, bottleneck guitar, pedal steel, even maybe perhaps, um, certainly electric bass, rock and jazz and funk drumming, uh, rhythm, rhythm guitar playing. Um, and from the vocal side, there's also drones and chant-based uh, chant-based roles that do not have a break in the sound because they're large groups that are um, vocalizing. So there's never necessarily a break. So I have actually a list going of, of my sort of, here's why you wouldn't want to circular breathe as a wind player, which has two reasons. And here's why you would, which I have about um, 12, 12 reasons why I don't have them in here right now. But, uh, it's 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 a whole nother um, realm set a set of realms open up for the soloist for ensembles uh, just for practicing and so if you don't know uh, if if you don't experience the technique and you don't know what and and you don't understand the styles or the other roles that you could take when you can do this and it's actually not a technique it's a sub technique. Uh, then, of course, you would think, why would you do that? 
you wouldn't do it. The two reasons you wouldn't do it are to play one note for a really long time as, as, as a novelty, unless, unless that was, unless people came up on the side chat and said, I'm going to put a lot of money in your PayPal that you just gave me. If you hold one note for a really long time, that's called uh, sort of like woodwind mercenary, then you would do it. Um, but normally there's not a real good reason to hold one note for a long time. Uh, and certainly not for the reason of just doing it. Number two, linking together melody phrases that are supposed to be phrased, meaning breathing in between them should happen. So those are the two reasons you don't circular breathe, um, but there's about 12 reasons that you do. And so that's my, uh, that's my shtick. And then we're gonna, we're gonna open this. I'm getting a little thirsty for more than just tea. Um, and here's a, here's a, a nod to, um, speakeasies now now look at this now what 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 are the odds that james simon is on here and probably last time we saw each other might have been in the iu uh uh cafeteria this this came this came from our college cafeteria it wasn't appropriated it wasn't stolen it was a, a party favor like i said they, they let you they let you take um dishes if you if you really enjoyed their aesthetic value that's right Reed. And um, read cafeteria. So um, here, here's here's to everybody. We've gone even long. Final, uh, final words over here. Thanks, Facebook people. Uh, so maybe in May, maybe the uh, Sunday in May, I'll probably do another one of these, whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube. And and the other possibilities for um, repertoire would be something like an all honkyoku concert, like only the Zen pieces on a variety of flutes, or alternatively, all small flute, high energy pieces. So like the ending of Green Swampy Water, I have a bunch of originals uh, that I've written for the small flute, and those are on the album. That's under the title, not so much Bamboo Gospel, but Shakuhachi Unleashed is the name of that repertoire. Okay. So I've got a whole, I've got a whole, world of sounds and uh, aesthetic concepts going on over here. And thanks, for, thanks everybody for coming out today. And, um, oh yeah, yeah, that's Corey Harris. We got Cedric Burnside, Corey Harris, and of course the old, the old timey Blind Willie Johnson. Also, here's, here's the last uh, recommendation for the day. Uh, if you have an interest in these roots style, uh, um, American music styles, go to down home music, I think maybe.com. Anyway, down home music is a real brick and mortar record store in El Cerrito where I used to live. It's in the East Bay, north of Berkeley. And they are the home of the record labels Yazoo and Arhuli, which some of you music nerds, uh, may know uh, those labels that a lot of these things have been remastered or reissued by those labels and this record store is the headquarters so that's where those people who have been reissuing a lot of um otherwise would have been lost in archival um folk gospel blues um you name it and so i felt a little bit like i was behind in my research so um, but I ordered about eight. Uh, I don't even know what they are. They just look like really deeper and, and like the things that I already have. So some African American congregational singing and sermons and jubilee quartets and things like this from even from the twenties. Uh, and you don't get much earlier than that because um, the first recordings were basically nineteen. 17, 1915, maybe classical. First jazz recording was 1917. So we're only a hundred years into recording and recording is a magic. So flutes are magic. Uh, beer comes from a fermentation, that's magic. That's step five of alchemy, by the way, fermentation. And recording, that's a magic. The fact that we can actually hear uh, the same recording of a song, completely invisible, from Brian, Blind Willie Johnson just not quite a hundred years later, those were 1927, but so, uh, and YouTube, there's a lot of great stuff on YouTube. Yeah, I played, I played with Kyle in December, Mr. Simon, and that was pretty fun. 
So that's my question to James Simon. Are you still in Bloomington? There's still 16 of you around here. So go go be with your um, families, be in your safe. Oh, I see. I'll praise you. Uh, in your safe, um, stay at home. Don't be fooled by the idea that um, you know maybe going to church is a good idea. Um, I don't think that would be the case for any of you, but uh, that would be the best way to demonstrate that you don't care about your fellow human beings. Um, and with that note, um, any final thoughts? But this was fun. Let's do it again. We're going to end the live stream uh, now. Thanks so much to everybody over on the side there. See you on the next transmission. Good to see you there, Wesley. And uh, everybody enjoy your evening uh, beverages and food. Five, four, three, two.